Right, grade eights. In this unit, we're going to talk a little bit about the accounting cycle in any business. Now, what is the accounting cycle? It is basically a process where we show where a transaction originally takes place and how it is moved through different processes until it finally is recorded in the financial statements of the business. Why is it important that we have all these record keeping processes in place in our business? Because the owner wants to see the real picture of what has happened financially in this business in the financial year, in the past 12 months. Now remember we spoke about um, in the beginning of the year about a financial year versus a normal calendar year and we said calendar year we all know runs from the 1st of January till the 31st of December but a business's financial year can run in any 12 consecutive months. So it can start on the 1st of Jan until the 31st of December but many businesses, our government included, um, start their financial year on the 1st of March and then it runs through till the 28th of February. So normal Normally, we look at processes in the business for a financial year because then we can also make the season, decisions based on what we saw from this year compared to the last or the previous financial year. So if we look at the accounting cycle, it always starts with a transaction that takes place. Now, what is a transaction? A transaction is basically the exchange of money between two parties for either a service or a good that is provided. Now, it can be between two businesses. For example, when our business goes to buy stock from a wholesaler or a supplier, then the transaction takes place because we pay the supplier for the stock that we're taking. Or in many cases, it's between the business and the client, whether it's us providing a service to the client, like a hairdresser or an electrician, or whether we have a retail store and the client comes in and buys um, certain products or items from us. So a transaction takes place in the business. And from the moment the transaction takes place, we need to record it properly. Remember, we're not that kind of business where we say, oh, we'll write it down later or we'll remember because we won't. And then it means at the end of the year that we will not be able to tell the owner exactly what has happened in this business. So proper record keeping, extremely, extremely important. So a transaction takes place. How do we keep record of this transaction? We make use of documents in our business. So the next step is then to record this transaction on a document. Now all documents in the business will be recorded in duplicate, at least in duplicate. Why? Because for the business, we need to keep a copy of that document of that transaction and then we also need to give the customer proof of the transaction that took place. Now remember in the previous unit we looked at many different um, documents, source documents and the uses and when we use it and now I'm going to just split it up a little bit. So we have documents in the business that we use for cash receipts, so when the business receives money and also when the business pays out money for cash payments. Okay, so now let's ha um, um, have a look. What type of documents will we use or will we issue when our business receives money? If you can think back of the previous unit that we discussed, we said we issue a receipt. Right, and our source document will be a duplicate receipt because the original one will go to the client. So that's now, for example, when somebody pays us rent, they're renting a part of our building, we will issue them a receipt. You can also use a receipt if you've got a very small business and you don't necessarily have a toll or a cash register. Good. So then the other one that we also use quite often is then when we have a toll um, and then we have a cash register roll as our source document. We give the till slip that comes out of that little printer to the client and our source document will be the cash register roll that stays in the printer. That will be our 
document that we record our transactions from. And then we said, um, we've moved on and we're in um, um, modern times. So lots of times people will pay us via EFT. Now they will do an electronic funds transfer straight into our account. And those transactions we will find on our bank statement. Right. We also looked at the cash invoice. I'm putting it in brackets because in grade 8 we don't really, really work with that. These three are, are the ones that we use most in, um, um, in grade 8 accounting for recording cash uh, receipts, money that the business has received, and we need to record those transactions. So those are the source documents for every um, type of cash receipt transaction that we will deal with in accounting. Right, and then how do we, and um, what documents do we use when our business pays out money or buys something? First of all, our um, ancient document is then our check and we said our source document is the check counterfoil. Why? If we've written out that check, we've given it to the person or the business from whom we are buying, that check is gone. All that we have left in the checkbook is that small piece of paper which is the check counterfoil and from there we're going to record that transaction in the books of the business. Similarly as with this um, cash receipt, when our business pays um, anything via EFT, then we will see those transactions on our bank statement as well as money going out of our bank account. So this is the way in which we can record each and every single transaction that takes place in the business. Please remember that that's not the only ones that we will deal with, but for grade 8 accounting, that is what we will focus on. As you do grade 9 and hopefully 10 and 11 and 12, we will encounter more source documents. But for now, those are our source documents. Okay, so the transaction took place. We recorded that transaction on one of the source of documents that's applicable for that transaction. What do we do next? From the source document, we record these transactions, either cash receipts or cash payments in a journal. We also call this journal a book of first entry. Now, in grade 8, and I know many of you are very excited to start working in your journal books, we are going to work with our cash receipts journal. Cash receipts journal, in short, the CRJ, and with the cash payments journal, the C. PJ. Now I write the CRJ in green because that's normally the journal that we use for when we receive money. It's always nice, it's good and the cash payments journal we use for all the money that we have to pay out for all those transactions that we need to record. So step three is to take our source documents and then record that information on the source documents in our journals. In grade 8, we learn about the cash receipts journal and the cash payments journal. Right, at the end of each month, and this is done, the recording of the transactions um, from the source document into our journals is done on a daily basis. Actually, as the transactions take place, we record them in our journals. Come the end of the month, we're going to move on to step four. And that is when we take all the information in the journals, the CRJ and CPJ, and we compress them or summarize them. And we send it to or post it to the general ledger. Now we'll still learn a lot about the general ledger, but for now you only need to know that that's a summary of the transactions that took place in the CRJ and CPJ that we're going to reflect in the general ledger. Some of you might have heard that we talk about T accounts. It looks like a capital T. Now every account has a debit side and a credit side and we will explore that a little bit more in some of our next units and lessons that we're going to look at. But this information from the journal on a monthly or at the end of the month we take it 
to our general ledger. Now, once we've recorded all the information from the journals into our different general ledger accounts, we need to take that information even further, summarize it even more, and then we're going to prepare step five, a trial balance. Now, some of you might have heard about the double entry principle. Now, the double entry principle says that for every debit in the books of our business, there needs to be the same credit somewhere in the books of the business. Now, in the trial balance, we prepare it to see are all my debit amounts equal to all my credit amounts that I've written up in the general ledger. And we do that in a trial balance. There will be a column with a debit and a, or a document with a debit and a credit column. And at the end, after I've listed everything, these totals that I get at the end must be in balance. Then we know we've applied the double entry principle correctly. Don't worry about it too much. We're definitely going to explore it as we go ahead with accounting um, in the course of this year. So this is step five. And then the very last step that we're looking at is step six. And then we're going to look at our financial statements. Now, you might have heard over the news that companies have to um, um, make their financial statements available to the public. Um, people who buy shares in companies are always interested to see how the company has performed in the last financial year. And that is exactly what we need to prepare for our business. Even if we're just a small business or a small retailer or a partnership, those financial statements need to be drawn up. Now, there are two financial statements that we will learn about. Um, in grade 8 and 9, we don't really prepare them. We leave them for the higher grades. But it's important for you to know that they are there and what their functions are. So these two. The first one is the income statement. Now, the income statement, remember when we did the different elements or the, the accounting terms and definitions, we spoke about incomes and expenses and what those are. Now, from the trial balance that you've prepared, you will take all the income accounts and all the expense accounts and you will prepare an income statement. And in the income statement, at the end, we determine whether the business has made a profit or a loss. Now that's obviously very important for the owner to see. So that is what we do in the income statement. The other financial statement that we prepare is called our balance sheet. Now in the balance sheet we determine the financial position of the business. Now what does that mean? If we look at whether this business is financially sound. We for example look at things like um, how much stock does this business have? You know, sometimes we think if the shelves are full of um, um, items and we have lots of stock in the storeroom, it's very good. But it might be that that stock is going to become obsolete and we can't sell it. Or it takes us very long to sell that stock. Then it's an indication that something is perhaps not right um, in the business. Or we can see things like, for example, how much money is owed to us by debtors? Remember, we spoke about debtors briefly in term one as well. So what is the total value of the money owed to our business? And how long does it take for the debtors to pay us that money back? Perhaps it takes them too long and that can put our business in a bad financial position. We also need to look at, for example, how much money do, does our business owe to creditors? And how long does it take us to pay them back? So there's lots of interesting and important information that you can extract from the balance sheet. And that is why it's so important um, also for investors to look at specifically the balance sheet as well when they um, uh, this want to decide if they want to invest in a company or not. All right. Now, that is basically our accounting cycle that we've looked at in this unit. Um, and this will help us now to move on to the next unit where we're specifically going to look at the recording of transactions in the journals from the source documents.